All right, our last panel of the day. Uh, I'm excited for this one. It's it's titled the RIA panel uh, on your agenda. We updated it here a little bit to, to call it the multi, solving the multi-generational challenge. Uh, and that really came from the preparation conversations that we had with, with this esteemed panel uh, and, and figuring out what are they seeing right now and, and what are the biggest challenges facing the RIA space. And ultimately, I think what, we hear, what we're hearing a lot about is this multi-generational challenge, both uh, building multi-generational firms, serving with multi-generational teams, as well as serving, ultimately then serving multi-generational clients. And so that's what we're going to have a conversation about today is how do we solve this multi-generational challenge uh, on multiple fronts when it comes to the RAA space or, or maybe even more broadly as well. So to join me in that conversation, we have three incredible panelists. First, we'll have Catherine Lintz. She's the managing member, partner, managing member, co-founder uh, as well of Matter Family Office, a uh, family office here, a multifamily office here in St. Louis. We'll also be joined by Al Sears, Vice President of Dimensional Fund Advisors and uh, Special uh, Advisor to the executive team there. Uh, and then we'll also hear from Peter Bieland, founder of Bieland Group uh, that runs a boutique um, uh, consultancy, research and consultancy firm uh, focused on the fee-based space. So. With that, please let me welcome Peter, Al, and Kathy for our final session of the day. You know, I gotta say, just before we get into this, uh, like I said, I've been a part of this, this conference now for the last four, four years, I believe. Uh, I've attended every, every iteration. Uh, and it kind of surprised me that we had never really had anything focused on the independent RAA space. Uh, especially given how strong that ecosystem here is here in St. Louis. Uh, and so when, when we had the opportunity to, to plan this year's iteration, I thought we have, to, we have to get together. We have to do this. Of course, the RIA industry, though, is, I mean, we could go a million different ways with this conversation. And, and I think a lot of the challenge of planning it was figuring out what do we want to talk about. And ultimately, what we, talk, we, we settled on here is this multi-generational challenge. And I think about that multi-generational challenge, it's, it also means transition. And transition means incredible amount of opportunity, but it also means a lot of, a lot of unknowns. And so hopefully we're gonna dive into how are, how are we seeing different types of organizations tackle those unknowns. At the highest level, I think about, let's start with sort of building this multi-generational organization, if we will, kind of the what are we talking about here in this space. I think about this in two different lenses. I think there's, there's first fostering the culture to have an organization that can be multi-generational and that can be sustainable. But then there's also uh, the transitioning leadership and ownership and, and being a part of that, of that um, opportunity there. Uh, let's start with the, the first one, it's a little bit higher level. How, thinking about how does a firm foster a culture that promotes longevity as well as encourage you know, growth and development of that next generation? So how, how do you think about setting up a multi-generational firm? And is that something that, well, if we're already out there doing it, we're, we've kind of lost it, or is there an opportunity to maybe transition? Kathy, I'd love to, to start with you, because I know Matter of Family Office has actually gone through a little bit of that, of that transition itself in its history. Thanks so much. It's nice to be here today, and nice to see you all. Thanks for hanging in here for the last <laughs> session of the day. Um, when we really start to frame the opportunity of building a multi-generational firm to serve multi-generational families, uh, and hopefully with long-term multi-generational capital, it's very complex. And we really ought to start with just remembering that this is really the first time in the history of mankind that we're gonna have, that most of our families that we serve are going to have, many of them are gonna have four generation, living generations. The average life expectancy is 82. Uh, at the beginning of last century, it was 48. 15% uh, of uh, people over 70 will live to age 100. So I think we really start with, it matter, we start with thinking about the challenge of what that means for our families. And then how do we marry and serve those families by building a really intentional multi-generational firm so that we're here to serve those families across the generations. It also means that communication 
and investing in great communication skills within your firm and within your family, your client families, is more important and more complicated than it's ever been. Um, when you have four living generations around one pool of capital as a family client, that's exponentially more complex. When you have um, three generations, you have 25 year old, 45 year olds and 65 year olds working in your firm, that's very complex. And you're always transitioning within teams and roles in your firm and you're matchmaking those transitions within the families that you serve. So to just frame the conversation today, I want to start with just thinking how hard that is and accepting it. And as leaders and future leaders of the firms that you all uh, represent, don't underestimate the, the scale of the challenge because it's there, it's going to be there every day, it's going to continue to be there and it, it needs to be stewarded and tended. So that big challenge really sets a table for us at Matter. And Al, I'd, I'd love to, to sort of look to you and thinking about a multi-generational organization because currently with, with Dimensional Fund Advisors, but in a previous life, you were also COO and president of a large RAA in TAMP here in St. Louis, was BAM Advisor Services, now Buckingham Strategic Partners. Right. Uh, but, but a part of an organization that went through a generational change and you were actually part of <clears throat> Sort of that next generation that comes in. I'd love to hear what was your experience like, and, and then and then when you were sitting in that seat, how did you think about, you know, then building a multi generational organization? Then, yeah, I'm okay. Good. I was afraid to talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one, I'm certainly humbled to be sitting here talking, and that anybody's still here listening to to this and having this conversation. Um, they know we have drinks after this. That's why this is the fun group. I'm that no fool. That we've got here. That's right. Yeah, I'm no fool, but. Um, Last time I was here, the guy who sat right here was David Booth, uh, the guy I work for. And he's really changed the financial landscape, of course. So I'm like, well, I'm, I get a chance to sit right where he did and, and maybe some of you will listen to me. So that's very, that's kind of neat. But yeah, I was part of Buckingham and the, you know, the founder of it's right here in the room. And I don't, I don't know if Stuart was recognized earlier, but the RA space, when Stuart got into it, uh, as a founder of Buckingham was um, the wild, wild west. Like nobody knew where it was going to go. Um, the idea of an RIA was a registered investment advisor. And so it was a, really around this idea of investments. And um, that's what it started off to be. You know, you were looking at it at the time as I think we had some Morningstar software and trying to look at the five star ratings of the investments and picking those for the, for the clients. And then over time, we found dimensional fund advisors and we realized we don't have to beat the market. We don't have to spend our time trying to find um, the next outperformer. What we do need to do is get to know our clients. You know, asset management is a thing, the asset. Wealth management is a person. It's, it's their dreams, it's their goals. It's what's keeping them up at night, right? So um, when Stuart and the gang started that, um, they didn't know what it was going to become. And now it's a foregone conclusion what an RIA mostly is. So that's happened in one generation. And I was honored to be brought on and then become a partner and um, president, COO, and board member making decisions for a, for a firm that G1 took the risk. G2 had the luxury that the risk was kind of it was there, but not nearly as much as it was for that G1. So what an honor it was to kind of like take it to the next level. And in some ways, the G2 had a skill set G1 didn't have. You know, they were great at running a business and we were willing to not be an advisor, not to be in the front um, winning the business, but actually running the business, taking it to a whole new level. So they had the foresight, though, to put a succession plan in place. And I think that's the real trouble and the opportunity for the young folks in the room is this industry has not figured it out. It's, a tsunami, it's like the silver tsunami of all these people that are, have built great practices and they don't know how to get out of them. Um, and the multiple uh, 
value of their firms has expanded beyond anything they ever expected. So now they're thinking about like, how do I preserve my culture, my staff, the way I invest, the, the client experience, the name may be on the marquee, and it's a little too late in some ways. Um, but anyway, the, and then there's a the third generation that are, you know, I'm, I'm mid forties and, uh, you know, at Buckingham, there was the first gen, second gen. Now there's a third gen, like this has happened in rapid order. Peter, anything you'd like to add? To that? So, yeah. right. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure to be here as well. Thanks for your interest in this topic. Um, <clears throat> I primarily work with financial institutions that have investment business and RIA firms, independent RIA firms. So, you know, my comments will be focused around that. And, you know, we've seen a change in the industry and in the environment so much in the sense that um, advisors in the past would have a client or maybe a family, but they'd have that client and that family. You know, in years ago, so much of the income was earned at that initial meeting. It was a commission-based business. It was earned initially. And there wasn't as much focus on that ongoing relationship and on the next generation and on the following generation because the revenue didn't quite follow that. Well, <clears throat> now we see, you know, the last number of years, especially with RIAs, the revenue's focused on, you know, an ongoing revenue stream. And advisors haven't completely adapted to that revenue stream in the way they should be managing and taking care of their clients, which is multi-generational. Because we all know how difficult it is to bring in new clients, new families. I think the number, the number is six new families the average Merrill Lynch advisor brings in. Now, that's a million and above. But it's six new families over the course of a year, a Merrill Lynch advisor. And I'm sure that's not different in other wirehouses or in many RIAs. But that's not a large number. And that shows exactly how critical it is to retain the clients that you have. And there are going to be changes in that family, in the needs of that family. And unless you can focus on retaining those clients that you have, keeping them for multiple generations, it's far too difficult to try and find new families or clients to bring in at a pace that you need to, to compensate for the ones that are leaving. So I think the industry is changing the right direction, but it's having to, to change behaviors of a lot of folks. And what you all can do is bring that, that new approach to it. You can bring that better approach because it absolutely is, you know, based on how difficult it is to retain and, and attract new clients in today's environment. Well, one thing and I, I want to touch on is thinking about sort of transitioning leadership, thinking about at the, at the organization level still. I've heard this a couple of times, Al, you had talked about G2 has different skill sets than G1. Um, Peter, you're talking about, you know, maintaining relationships and, and through that transition. I, I'm curious about uh, one of the large, one of the biggest issues that we see is uh, being able, the, the economics of, of the, the situation, right? And how do we, you've built a, a great business, how do we actually go ahead and transition that, that ownership? And it seems like the, the idea right now is that you either take a big discount and you do it internally, or you go find an M&A partner uh, and you either sell to them, or maybe you, you yourself become an M&A partner uh, or an M&A aggregator and you buy talent. Right, and you bring in that new talent, you bring in that new energy. Is that what, how do you all think about that in terms of the options out there uh, for, for RIAs to transition that ownership and that leadership and what that mechanism could look like? Maybe Kathy, I know that you, you've got a real passionate opinion on this. We, we talked pretty, <laughs> we talked, talked a lot, a lot about, about this. Yeah, and I'd, I'd love for you to share that. Um, and um, I apologize if, if this comes off as harsh to anyone in the room, but I think you have to make your choice. Are you building something uh, firm or a practice that is sustainable? Or are you building kind of a producer practice where, you know, the producer kind of gets a, the, a lot of the economic benefits and you haven't invested in and shared? It's really a sharing choice. Uh, the economic benefits with the rest of the team. If you're choosing that, that's great. That's your, that's your choice. But recognize that, in my opinion, that you're taking the economics as you go. So there's not 
a terminal value really for your practice that's going to be nearly as high as it would be is if you invest in talent and team over time. Um, there's not a right or a wrong. There really isn't. Just don't think you're, don't pretend <laughs> that you're doing one or the other, because it's not really fair to you or the young people that come in and don't have a clear per career path. Um, you'll be disappointed perhaps at, at the end when you're uh, want to retire or need to retire due to some illness or something when your 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 client um, um, your your clients aren't able to be sold or transferred at a at a dollar amount that you think is fair. Um, we've taken the what we call the less is more strategy, which is very multi generationally internally, very uh, we have very intentional. Uh, 60 something, 40 something, 20 somethings on the team, and we share. We intentionally share the revenue of the client and invest in that team so that they're there for the next generation. Now, that means we make less than many people in the business today, but that means that the underlying value of the long term client relationship that we put as a, at a very high value for us uh, psychically and then long term we actually do have a sustainable firm but it is a it is a conscious choice and it is less more now less now uh, to have a different result and a different outcome later so oh or peter go yeah. ahead yeah yeah the um those are great points. They really are. You, you, you do, do need to be intentional about what you build. Um, the majority of firms that we've worked with are a firms that get to a point where they want to change ownership um, end up selling. And I don't know if that's right or wrong, but that's what the majority of them are, you know, are doing out there. I think there's, there's 65, 70 deals, typically a quarter that are you know, in the U.S. of RIA firms selling that are publicized. There's probably some more internally that are done among employees, but, you know, those tend to go to the aggregators that are out there. Um, you know, that's a very active business. The aggr aggregators are, you know, always trying to buy. The RIAs are trying to get the highest price. Um, you know, it's it, there's always a buyer right now for the RIA firm. And I think that distracts many of those leaders because they know that they could always get a check for two and three quarters of recurring revenue. So they may not make that investment in the next generation. And they look at it as I can cash out and not necessarily you know, keep that business going long-term. But, you know, and a lot do, but you know, from the client perspective, from the family perspective, and in many times from the employee perspective, Keeping that organization intact versus selling is the better outcome for that firm and for those for those clients. So you need to be intentional on what your choice is, and then you know manage that business accordingly. Um, but you know, be prepared for anything. We've worked with the firm that that really wanted to sell to their employees. They had every intent for 20 years. The individual running it told the employees and plan to sell it to, and distribute it to those employees when the time came. The problem is that leader never built the succession team. As much as he wanted to do it, he didn't do it. And when the time came, he couldn't turn the business over because there weren't the next level of leadership in place to do it. So to Kathy's point, it needs to be intentional. Otherwise, unless you put the things in place, you can have the best intentions in the world, but without the actions in place, it's not going to be able to happen. Uh, I know you're, in your current role, a lot of what you're doing is, is in fact, M&A advising for, for RAs out there, right? I'd love to hear yeah. what you're seeing, what their options are, and, and what are people responding to? Yeah, I think Dimensional's uh, way of investing just, um, like the Venn diagram, it's kind of perfect, the talent set, that our RA has in their mentality of doing right for the client and then um, kind of an evidence-based investing works. And so we have well over, 
I think, 23,000 RIAs that use us. And they're very loyal clients of Dimensional. And um, so I do have that honor of working with these firms that are looking to exit or at least think of bringing on a new partner. And it's exactly that is sometimes little too, it's far too little, way too late um, to execute the way they want to. So it goes beyond the best intentions. Like I intend to sell my practice to the next generation. Um, that's just not good enough. You actually have to put it into action and execute. Uh, when I was brought into the partnership group at Buckingham and the role I had, that was, it was a little red book. <laughs> that was the secret red book for the first gen and who they've identified as the second gen uh, to take certain roles and give them certain experiences to ensure they were ready to take over that mantle when and if they needed to. Um, and that included flying us to conferences or putting us into a board uh, meeting and um, very purposeful, action, uh, actionable um, experiences and coaching that was genuine coaching. It wasn't, hey, let me give you some feedback and how you could do it was, you know, you felt like you had a mentor. You, actually, we had a mentorship program. Um, and it was, you know, it was purpose. And then there was execution on it. And so that really enabled the company to do as much as it could to bring succession about internally to the, to the degree we could. Um, what I do think, though, is... You know, it's, it's great. Like, oh, it's cute. Uh, you built a good practice. You want to do right by your employees. But um, when that big check gets floated, my gosh, you see all these virtues, the non-negotiables of the, the founder and the owner. Well, that didn't matter as much. Or, well, well, you know, and then all these excuses happen and then they sign the check and culture's gone or investment philosophy's gone. And it's not always dire. Sometimes it's actually excellent for the next gen. They get into a larger company and they have new opportunities. But if you own an RIA and you want to uh, have some kind of internal succession, and you can, you can remain fiercely independent as long as you want to. You, you know, what Peter and I were talking about and Kathy is that there's a lot of fear mongering of like, oh, if you own an RIA and you're out there by yourself or just a couple employees, technology is going to crush you regulatory stuff's going to crush you, HR stuff's going to crush you. There's solutions for it. You don't have to sell if you don't want to. But yeah. you have to be mindful and move in that direction. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting, too, because we've been hearing that for a long time, right? It's going to be a barbell industry. You're either going to be, you're either going to be a, a solo practitioner with a small client count, a lifestyle practice, or you're going to get scooped up by an aggregator. And I, and I think, to your point, uh, it's, it's quite the opposite in terms of the technology. I don't think the technology is going to crush anybody. I think, in fact, the technology makes it easier for people to run the practice that they see fit for themselves, right? Whether it is that solo practitioner or it is joining that, I think there's an opportunity there uh, by, by leveraging today's technologies and, and you know, what, what we're seeing there. All right. <clears throat> Let's transition a little bit because one thing you touched on, and I want to touch on this, especially for, for if any of the students are of age and going to be drinking with us here in, in about 30 minutes. Uh, mentorship, Al, you've touched on this a couple of times that in your, in your uh, experience, you had mentorship that you were able to, you know, to use that to, to advance in your career. Kathy, I know that, that at Matter Family Office, you guys are very, very, to use this word again, intentional about developing uh, your people and developing those teams that 60, 40, 20. I'm curious, in your own experience, maybe Kathy, in your own experience, how important was mentorship to you? And, and how have you then now sort of passed that along to, to the next generation of your firm? Um, well, I started the firm in 1990. So I'm one of the RIA pioneers in that way. You know, I didn't want to be. I call myself the accidental entrepreneur. I just couldn't find a, a firm that did the work the way I thought it should be done. So I had to start my own firm and it was scary. And I borrowed $25,000 from my husband's 401k and uh, started a firm. Um, didn't take any salary for two to three years um, and always invested in talent. I don't think there's ever a substitute for talent. So um, I'm still a bit of a talent hound. I'm always looking for talent, whether it's the server at the restaurant, because a great 
client service person, it's hard to find. So I'm always looking for talent. Anyway, so the I think in terms of mentorship, I think I've been very fortunate in that I've learned from so many people and we try to create a learning culture and a multi-generational learning culture. I'm learning from my young associates as hopefully they're learning from me. I'm learning from every client, every client we've ever had, I've learned something from. And I look forward to new clients because they teach me more things. So I think when you create a culture of, of um, give and get learning, that that creates an environment where, um, where mentorship doesn't have to be as formal, perhaps, is it just maybe in the air or in the water of the organization? Because you're collaborating on problems and you're learning um, from those um, opportunities to work together. So we do have formal mentorship programs with coaching. Uh, we've learned a lot from industrial psychologists. We've started, we've used an industrial psychologist since 1998 for all of our hiring. Um, we have coaches, um, outside coaches uh, for our senior leadership team um, because it's sometimes hard to hold up the mirror and it's also sometimes hard to give honest feedback. So we need some help in that. Um, but um, I think, I think it's, I think cultures really learning culture, being a learning team and a learning organization is maybe the most important thing. And then what comes from that is formal and informal mentoring. I kind of had to make it up as I went along. I didn't really have a mentor. So Peter, I, you, I, I think ever. teams are, are the, the best answer in today's environment. Um, a sole practitioner, trying to do it on their own, I, I think that the odds are against an individual to be able to succeed, to, to know everything that they need to know, to have all the skill sets, you know, to, do, to be able to do what you really need to compete with the firms out there that are doing it right. I think it's extremely difficult for an individual to do it. So I think from that perspective, teams make a lot of sense. And if you think about when you put a team together, um, you know, it's really an apprenticeship for a lot of the younger folks that are part of that team. And, it, you know, you look at other trades, if you will, that, you know, were more prevalent um, in, you know, construction, you know, bricklayers, carpenters, electricians. How did every one of those people that are in that industry, those industries, learn their craft? Well, they were an apprentice somewhere. They worked for somebody that knew it, and that's who taught them. Why is our business thought of as any different than that? I mean, you know, you don't get your hands as dirty, but it's the same type of skill that you need specific to our industry. So if you go to market as a team, you're able to have, you know, this apprentice role in place, which really brings along the newer folks. You teach them the way that the organization's culture is, so it benefits the people that are leading those younger folks and the client gets the benefit, you know, of a multi-generational team. And that team team can take the form of, you know, two people, but, you know, hopefully more. Um, if, if I were running an RIA today, I would not allow a client meeting with one individual representing the firm. I wouldn't allow it. I think you, I think you're stronger with using the full group of talent that you have. So teams to me, when, you know, for those of you starting in your careers, you know, find a way to get on a team. Don't try and do it alone. Be an apprentice, get on a team. It'll, I guarantee you it'll help your career. Yeah, I would add to that exactly is that um, <clears throat> doing it yourself is, is, you know, I think there's an, um, or even if you're on a team, and you're an advisor, you're compelled to think you have to be the smartest person when a client comes to you and they have all sorts of questions you know, about an inherited IRA or something like, you don't have to have the answers. In fact, um, I think it waters down your credibility if you think you do, because they know you don't. So having, it could be a, 
you know, you could have direct access to talent down the hall, or you could be part of a TAMP, or you could have um, industry colleagues. And that's super important, I think, in our industry is just to have a sense of community outside of your office. Um, it's very isolating when you're running your own practice. Am I doing this right? Um, I was just in a study group in Texas a few weeks ago and two billion plus uh, dollar RIAs and they realized in that discussion, they all had the same problems. They thought they were like, well, it must be my team. We're not doing something right. But there was some comfort in knowing that the community had an issue. So, um, but just to back up a little bit is in speaking to anybody entering the industry or in the industry, when I talk to people looking to sell, they always say to me, um, unless I can find that unicorn, that's you guys, um, I'm going to sell my practice. So you have no idea the leverage you have uh, out there. It's just kind of meeting up with the right um, kind of Cinderella and the slipper here, but it is, there's a dearth of talent um, in the RIA space. You are wanted, you're needed. Um, so it's just, you know, a matter of finding that place to be and having what, which I think is super important, some patience. Like G1 did a lot of that pioneering, like Kathy was talking about, um, learn from that. But also, like I was thinking of this golf analogy is if anybody golfs is, and I don't, but it's a good analogy is if you happen to have that same putt and you see somebody else with it, like G1, they kind of messed up on culture. They kind of could have done something better. You have the luxury of putting next. And you, so you can learn a lot from that mentorship of that G1, what they did well, what they could have done better. And you can leverage that for the benefit of your clients, through your associates, yourself. Um, yeah, in, in the general good of what we do here. Well, I, the talent obviously is one of the biggest uh, issues in our industry, and that's the word that we've been saying a lot here. Um, attracting talent, retaining talent, being certainly attracting talent being one of the biggest challenges um, that we see there. I think it creates an obviously an opportunity for for those talented folks that are being uh, you know looked for. But for some reason, we, it seems like we still haven't figured that that out. Peter, you run a study on compensation and and retaining talent and, and whatnot. I'd love to see what, you know, in, in your most recent studies or what are you seeing out there in terms of maybe what are some of those challenges that people are facing and then how are they meeting those challenges as well? Yeah. So um, about 6% of advisors turn over in a given year in, on aggregate. And, you know, so a firm has to add 6% of their number of advisors just to stay even with their headcount. You know, advisor base. So that's kind of at a macro level. Now that's down. I'd say, you know, kind of four or five years ago, it was 10, 11%. So that turnover has, has decreased a little bit, but it's still significant. And uh, as Ed says, I mean, you know, finding the right folks is extremely difficult. I think, you know, you all getting into this profession, I mean, this is, an ideal time to get into this profession. Firms need really skilled people. They, they need them so bad. Um, an RIA that we worked with, it was a, uh, we, we were worked with, we worked with a firm that was a $2 billion RIA. And they were eventually purchased by an $8 billion IRA. And the reason that the deal was done was because that $8 billion firm needed the talent in this $2 billion IRA, RAA. They wanted the assets. That was really important, but they needed the talent. And that's why they did the deal. That's how important it was to them. So, you know, if a firm's going out and acquiring just to get the employees of another organization, then it shows how, you know, how few there are out there for how much needs, you know, the, the industry has and how much needs of the firm has. So I, I think, you know, you're in the right spot at the right time. I'm surprised more folks aren't in it, but, but they aren't. So take advantage of that. And I think your opportunities, you know, are tremendous in this space. And uh, I wish I could be an advocate, you know, to, to 
people that are trying to get into this space because the industry needs, they, we need you. We need you. There isn't the next, there aren't enough in these next generations to follow, you know, my generation. There just aren't enough. I, so, yeah, I yeah. was just thinking back in, uh, after 08 and 09, um, a lot of genera <laughs> generation like you guys saw your parents maybe lose their home or certainly lost jobs. And I think it scared people from our industry. Uh, at one point, I saw a survey that um, financial advisors were just below uh, used car salespeople in terms of trustworthiness. Um, and so, and there is still a little of that in the industry, and it's certainly not in the registered investment advisory industry where you're held to fiduciary standard and the regulatory system is incredibly burdensome for such a good, honest uh, 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 job, right? So, but what I would say is that th th I think that created the dearth of talent. Um, it scared some people away. Um, but also, even when this first started, the program here at WashU, I, I think I spoke at one of the, maybe the first or second um, conferences, and the entire room was full of folks that just had questions about, because I was still the dimensional spokesperson, um, you know, what is the capital market assumption for emerging markets over the next several years? And so it was very focused still on the asset management part of the industry, and it's quicker money coming out of WashU. Uh, it's quicker money just, you know, in some sense, but when I look at it, um, wealth management's more fulfilling, it allows you to be home with your family. Um, I think there's, I think you actually do much better financially over time. It's much more rewarding, I think, to, to be a, in an RIA and to hopefully own some and, and participate in that. But most importantly, I think what it's inspiring much more than asset management is, is, you know, I think of autonomy, mastery, and purpose. You get all three of those when you work in an RIA. Um, there's a ton of autonomy, unless you're working for, there's some very large RIAs these days. Um, but uh, mostly you get that autonomy that you deserve. Um, if you're coming through WashU in the MBA program, it, you, you deserve it. And then the mastery, like that's, that's beautiful. Like when you're talking, Peter's talking about apprenticeship, you know, those crafts, people hang their, their hat at night, very proud of the mastery they have in that particular craft. And this one is just incredible in that regard. We have purpose. Um, to be on this panel right after the panel that we have, where you realize, you know, somebody is $400 away from or incarceration away from total bankruptcy. And, uh, you know, to be, you can help people, first generation folks that hadn't gone to college or hadn't had opportunities and then earn their, their money. And um, it's an incredible opportunity. And then of course, there's the other side, which I steer away from is like that, those VIPs that money is control and money is everything. And that's who they are. And, um, you don't have to work with those people or you can, you know, they need help too. Uh, you probably need some psychologists on staff and everything else with that. But um, yeah, the, the middle America and, um, and lower, uh, they need help. You need a lot of help. And there are still people um, I'm unwinding. My mother-in-law passed last month after a very brave battle with brain cancer and we didn't know she had anything. I brought a checkbook to the funeral home expecting to, to pay for it. She had squirreled away so much every which way to Sunday, right? But she was never honest about it. So the stuff that she invested in is awful. Just she's got scam left and right. Um, but when I bring those dollars now to a financial advisor, that was somebody's hard work um, in dreams and everything. She was very purposeful on why she didn't spend that money. So money can bring you purpose in life. When you, and I've been there when a financial advisor, we were at a conference and the phone rang and it was a lady whose husband just got killed in a Pennsylvania highway in an ice storm, car slid off the road. And she wasn't calling about the money. She didn't know she was lost. 
team know who to call, right? So, or the weddings, let's go with something positive. Or the financial advisor, I've seen some corny commercials, but that happens when somebody comes, the financial advisors at the wedding because they help get to that point. So it can be fun. You know, Stuart, uh, when they started Buckingham uh, on a yellow legal pad was the business plan. And right along one of those numbers was have fun. Like this is, a, you don't have to take yourself too seriously in it. I mean, you have to take your clients seriously. It's a duty of care that you have with their money, but you can have a lot of fun along the way. I'd like to add a little bit to those great comments from both of you. It, it's really not about the money. It's about solving problems. It's about helping people reach their objectives. The money is just the engine that allows some of those decisions to be made and support the decisions. Um, it's really about being a thought partner with your families and being an honest um, uh, sounding board, helping them navigate all sorts of decisions. Um, there's being the first call that they have when something go is good or something is bad. So it's an honor position. Um, and I would say, oh, two thirds of the meeting time is not about the money. It's about everything else that's really important to them. So it's, it's, it's not exactly what you think. It's a noble profession. I really believe it. it's a noble profession. And you'll find that the folks that do the best in it long term and enjoy it the most and are most successful got into it because of that reason mm -hmm. because it's a noble profession I love, that. I love the focus on on the clients there too right and, and and i think that's a recurring theme that you always hear whenever you're talking to certainly folks in in this in the ra space is that like you said Aller, was said earlier i got into this space because of the clients i got into this space to do the work the noble profession to have that that purpose and that that impact but, but we also know that talking about this multi-generational question, we're serving multi-generational families now, purpose, impact, what folks are looking for from their relationship with an advisor are changing. And quite frankly, we might have to have multiple ways to service if you really think about more at the family level than, than necessarily at just the, the individual that's coming to you level. Uh, I'd love to know, you know, and Kathy, I know you, you've done a lot of work on this and you talked about this four or five, six generations potentially that we're having to serve, having to service here. Uh, how are you out there understanding the unique needs of those generations, the, the different needs of those generations, and then and then again meeting those needs? But from I know you said you've set up that 60, 40, 20 sort of team, and I, I'm assuming age is there is what is what we're talking about there. But how else are you, you thinking about meeting those different needs of those different generations? It's a great question. Um, as I said, we learn from our families every day. So asking them what's on their mind isn't obvious, but it's something that advisors forget to do because they're looking at being the answer man or answer woman. Um, so really listen, learning how to listen, uh, learning how to help them think forward on what stages will come next and learning what they, and trying to help them prepare with information in the way they need to receive information so that they're prepared to make great decisions when the time comes. And then we do a lot of facilitated conversations between generations and we do practice. We do practice uh, conversations um, so that when difficult times are, are coming ahead, <laughs> difficult decisions need to be made that there's some, um, I would say, better communication skills or more clear communicate lines of communication um, so that they're um, so in stressful times which unfortunately come for all of us that there's um, uh, more skills and they're more prepared to have uh, to make to have good positive conversations um, and make decisions together um, at the generational level or the multi-generational level. Um, because as I said, this is a challenge with almost every one of our family is three generations living. At least 50% have four generations living. And we had one client that was close to having five living generations. 
She died at 103, and um, her great grandchild was um, um, her was pregnant. So we were really close to five living generations. So going forward, we just think investing in communication, uh, which means as advisors, we need different skills, right? We need facilitation skills. We need listening skills. We need um, to really think before you hold a meeting how we get the voices of everyone prepared to have the meeting. So um, we do more pre-calls before family meetings than we've ever done because there's more people in the mix. And so we want to prepare each person and don't want to in any way surprise anyone. So there's just more work, frankly. And I'm not sure, I don't think that the profession really is prepared for the level <laughs> in our fee structures and, and our structures of teams for how much work is going to be required and the different skills that'll be required to navigate these families going forward as, as more and more are two, three, four generations that you're navigating. It, it, it really does increase the complexity and probably should increase the fees. You know, really, there should be a different way to fee, to charge. Um, and we have a family office fee, which contemplates some of that complexity, but many, in addition to an asset management fee, but many firms do not. So I actually, you know, people talk about fees coming down. I don't see that. I see the complexity increasing. AI is going to help a little, you know, help on some things, but I, I, I the, the balance, it's a complexity with more, more people to collaborate with in those families. Peter, anything yeah. that, that you'd add there? No, I, I think one of the best qualities to have in this role is humility. And, you know, so many times we as an advisor are supposed to have the answers for folks. You know, they come to us for answers. We're supposed to be on top of things. We're supposed to know all this. But there's times that we maybe don't win a piece of business or a client isn't satisfied. And we have to then step out of that role of being the all-knowing and really find out from them and really listen to them and, and take heart to what they say of why we didn't get it or what we did wrong or what we could have done better so that we could improve. And, and I find that's sometimes a hard balance for folks because, you know, because of that role that they're 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 in the position of you know, being confident and authoritative in what they're doing, but then to really step into a different role and accept a loss, but be able to improve from that loss. I think that helps, you know, that could help immensely. That, that builds trust. It, trust is important and in you this grow, role. And you grow then as an individual and as a firm to what your client base, what your employees, what your partners, what your teammates, you know, notice, mm -hmm. but you have to be willing to embrace it and listen and learn from it. And that's the, you know, that's the sometimes okay. challenging part. Yeah. And we're not, um, you know, we're not brain surgeons here, right? So it's okay when the client's in the room to say, I don't know. You don't want your brain surgeon saying that if you have a question <laughs> and they're about to go in, but um, it, it does, it builds trust I mean, who knows everything. And, um, one of the things that I've learned is it's best just to think of yourself as kind of that quarterback of the team or a, hey, I don't know, but I have somebody that does, or I'll be right back to you. Uh, most important part, um, to really reduce it into, uh, you know, there's so much complexity here, but you build a good relationship. That's number one. That's why my that advisor talked about got the phone call when his when her husband died. Right, deep relationships will win the day all day, and then you offer good solutions like obviously investments, but tax awareness and uh, philanthropy, charitable in, uh, inclinations, and uh, anything else that might be top of mind for them. And then, and here's the big one where people fail more than anything: be responsive. Like it's still just kind of basics. Um, but yet last night I 
uh, emailed my advisor about something and I'm a night owl. So it was kind of like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Uh, email. They responded before I woke up with, yes, this is how you roll that over and this is what you need. And here's all the forms you, you need. Like that's overwhelming. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that being responsive could have been two days, but am I impressed? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. And that's just the basics, you know? So, um, in the world is changing. Like it used to be, uh, Hey, we're out at five and we'll, you know, the answering machine would come on and, um, you'd return calls the next day, but it is text messaging and you're kind of meeting the client where they are and what they need. Uh, and there's regulatory issues with some of that stuff and how you record those conversations. But nonetheless, we just, that's kind of learning the G1 learning from the G2 or the G2 learning from the G3. How do you want to, I heard that earlier from a panelist is, you guys want something different than our generation might have wanted on or expected. You know, you want to be able to get on and see your, your move money or pay bills or at all sorts of hours. Um, unfortunately, your advisor doesn't necessarily want to be the person responding at 10 p.m., uh, nor should they be. But the world's changing and, the, and we're trying to figure out how to respond to it. But the money's shifting to you. You know, um, as generations pass and down to the fifth generation, perhaps, um, we have to find new ways to engage and meet and build that relationship. Again, it's building the relationship and the trust. Um, I remember once when I was kind of in Ed's role, moderating and interviewing David Booth. And I said, so, you know, talking to him about what he does. And he said, it's a room full of wealth advisors. You do the heavy lifting. You've got the hard jobs. You build trust. You meet somebody at Starbucks over coffee and hear their, what's keeping them up at night, um, finding out where their pain points are in life, what their dreams and desires are. And okay, that's one thing, but then earning their trust where they're actually signing documents and wiring that money over. Uh, that is the hard part. And so you built a relationship, then you have to maintain that relationship. Um, and I think we'll, um, G1 RAAs and possibly G2 RAAs need your help figuring out how to connect now with the next, all right, you built the relationship with mom and dad. How do you build and, uh, and get into that psychology of that, of the kids? Cause that's an industry issue too. And maybe you already know that, but we certainly know that is it's, and Mather groups figured it out. Most of us haven't. How do when somebody passes, how does, how, how do those dollars stay in your firm? Um, they don't. Statistically, they don't. They say, well, you were my parents' advisor. That was cool. You kind of ignored me until I have the money, but you don't look like me. You don't talk like me. You don't probably text me back. I've got a person. So thanks for ignoring me and not, <laughs> not knowing anything about me until, uh, and then it seems very disingenuous, even if it's not. But we can learn a lot from from everybody else too. I like that. And I think meeting people where they are, I mean, the, the way that people are, especially the next generation, G3, maybe four out there, I mean, thinking about Reddit, TikTok, you know, we can, we can laugh about it and we can say and, and cast it off as, as being ridiculous. But the legitimate truth is money is flowing in the direction of, of where, what, those, what those people are saying on those mediums, right? And so I think having people out there, having that next generation out there, understanding how to communicate and, and the means uh, is going to be really important to to hopefully people that aren't doing the, the reddit trading or uh you know getting going i don't know about crypto we won't, we won't touch that too much you know we've got a panel on that tomorrow but but even getting in caught up in all that getting their nugs yeah yeah <laughs> uh, um, all right i we're, we're only mindful of time because we do have i'm sure some cocktails out there i do want to open it up and see if we've got time if, if anyone has a question in the audience Got one, one back here. Oh, sure. <laughs> thank you, Olivia. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. I'm a student of SMP and a WELM program. I got a question about uh, as a student, how can we like uh, add some act specific value for a wealth management team at the beginning of our career? Love that. So question, how can, how can students come in and, and start adding value 
immediately. And I, and I like this maybe as a, a nice place to end for all the students in the, you know, if they're thinking about getting into this profession, we've said it's a noble profession. It's a, it's an impactful mm -hmm. profession. What are, what's maybe those first steps that, that somebody can take to, to start adding value and building their career? Peter, I'd <clears throat> well, I start as a student, I would take the SIE exam before you graduate. That you know, securities investment essentials exam. I would take that before you graduate, because many of the firms that you'll that you'll apply to will require you to get you know licensed with Series Seven, and the best way to prep for that is the SIE. And you'd be surprised at how many folks don't pass the Series Seven when they go to work for you know, a warehouse or a regional firm. So if you can get that ahead of the game, that's gonna help you get hired and once you're there. Very practical, I love that. I think you have a lot to offer already. I think you have your life experience. I think you have what's on your mind um, as a young professional starting out in your career. I think uh, you probably, pretty smart. I think we can throw problems at you that you're going to solve in ways that we wouldn't expect. So I think what Peter said is true. We need you. We value you. Come in, work hard. Listen, contribute. Don't be shy and show up. I don't think it's any more complicated than that, to tell you the truth. Um, um, for the firms that you want to work for. So um, you're already there. <laughs> okay. I, yeah. I was kind of thinking the same thing is to show up. <laughs> you have no idea. People just want your resume, um, especially from an institution like this. I would just add humility. You know, you, you um, it's, it's difficult. So I heard a few people out of Watch You that came in ready to kind of take the world by storm. And they had much more knowledge in their heads than I did. But, you know, there is kind of like uh, some patience needed. Like, well, we actually have, we have some shit to do today. Like, that's great. You're going to, you're going to bring our firm to a whole new level and make it more profitable. And, but right now we need you we kind of have stuff to do. Um, so just knowing that like you're not, your knowledge and hard work will be leveraged at some point, but come, come in and, and find a place to do it and just be a sponge too. just learn a lot. What um, I've seen most firms do, especially growing firms is just find your foot in the door and there's kind of uh, so many opportunities when you get in you'll find a place. It just might not be that first day you're there. I, I would just add to that as somebody who was not too terribly long ago, a, a young professional uh, getting into this industry. You know, my kids and my gray hair might, might tell on me a little bit. Uh, when I think back to that time, I, I think of that was an opportunity. That for me was like a, a PhD in the industry. Coming in as a new professional, you're, you're right, Al. I mean, there's, there's, your, your talents are going to be leveraged at some point. But I think right out of the gates, we've, we've got some work for you to do now, and let's just do that work now. I think that can be discouraging for young professionals to say, well, I've, I do have more to offer. Why are you making me do this work? I think the other way, the better way to look at that for me, at least in that my point in, in my career at the time was, this is actually an opportunity for me to learn. Why does this business do what it does? Why do we service clients this way? Why do we transact paperwork and new account openings this way? And then, oh, by the way, after you've learned that and I, you establish a little bit of credibility, if you raise your hand and say, hey, actually, maybe there's a better way to, to get this new account paperwork process, um, I have found that a lot of folks will listen to you, right? And so that would be maybe my advice, if, if I could offer it a little bit, would be look at, look at your entry level, that, that new opportunity as your PhD in this, in this industry, and, and you will take from it as much as you, uh, as you put into it. I would also add that you're learning the, some of the fundamental blocking and tackling things that have to happen every day. And you need to know that so that you can manage that in the future. And so if you haven't done it, it's hard to manage it. So there are some less glamorous parts of entry level jobs. And uh, but that will come in handy. 
big opportunities once you get past it, though, once mm -hmm. you're at, at that next level. Well, we're right there at time. I want to thank you all so much for your time today for this conversation. I think it's been tremendous for everybody that, that stuck with us. And hopefully everybody else will stick around and we'll have some drinks here. And if you've got any more questions or just generally want to network and get to know this, these fine folks, hopefully we will stick around and have a drink yeah. with everybody. Thank you. Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you.